We are looking at field day. It's this weekend, and that's what we're going to talk about. Now, the big boys are out and about. That means we don't have Bob and we don't have George, but we have Gordon, we have Amanda, and we have a special guest, Joe Eisenberg, K0NEB, the CQ Magazine kit editor. And he's going to be talking about field day. He's going to be talking about kits. He's going to be talking about something that he did to help the COVID first responders in Nebraska and a very prestigious award that he was just presented, which is really cool. We're going to do all that right now here on Ham Nation. Ham Nation is brought to you from LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remote. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by LastPass. Prepare for the unexpected in your business with LastPass. Trusted by over 17 million users and 61,000 businesses worldwide. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. This is Ham Nation, episode 459 for June 24th, 2020. Field Day, Kits, and more. Well, hello, ham people. It's Wednesday night. That is, if you're watching live. If you're not watching live, it doesn't really matter because it's Ham Nation time. Now, we're going to have an interesting show tonight because, well, the content, first off. But interesting because neither George nor Bob are here, which means the kids are really, really running the romper room tonight. We've got uh, over in uh, Colorado, we've got the lovely Amanda. Hello, darling. Hello. Uh, oh, we're going to talk, is... talk field day and stuff, aren't we? We are. We're going to uh, rule changes, how we adapt here, um, bonus points. Now that we're going to be... Uh, we're going to talk scoring and how things are going to be different this year because of COVID. So stay tuned. And I'll be watching chat room as well. Take your questions to the hosts at the end. Yeah, that's going to change a lot of stuff. We're also going to go over to uh, Nebraska where Joe Eisenberg, Mr. Kit, uh, K0NEB, the uh, CQ kit building editor is. Uh, you're also going to talk a little bit of field day and kits. And also you've got a, a you've got some COVID type stuff to talk about too, don't you, buddy? Yes, I do. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how we used 3D printer technology to uh, help out the first responders here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Going to be great. And uh, congratulations uh, in your effort in doing that. That's uh, that's awesome. It's God's work, man. That's, uh, that's amazing. And let's head over to the left coast where Gordon is there. Gordon's got his short shots. But first, tell us what's going on over in the Pacific time zone tonight. Well, we're all here. We're all ready for field day. And um, everybody's sort of jockeying for position as to where they're going to go. <clears throat> but um, it's exciting because two days ago, here on the West Coast, the left coast, they were working via FT8 on six meters, not just the East Coast that hogged all the Europeans uh, a couple of weeks ago, but out here we were working Europeans on FT8. So uh, we hope it's going to be an explosive uh, ionosphere for field day coming up in just about three days from now. So if everybody's ready, uh, let's take a trip and see what's happening with Field Day 2020. Well, gone are the days that Class A stations could operate with wall-to-wall people, wall-to-wall radios, elbows to elbows, and, and so on. So it's not going to be the same, but it doesn't mean it can't be exciting. <clears throat> But we have to be creative to figure out how we're going to get kids excited about field day at a distance, um, how we're going to get their parents excited about field day, getting their kids excited, because we need more kids and young kids to come to our hobby big time. And take a look at that radio. Let me tell you, Ray at ICOM was so generous. This is way back in 2005 and loaned us 
I think it's a $15,000 sort of a commercial radio. <clears throat> it was exciting to run that on field day. So the field day of side-by-side uh, -side operation and so on uh, is going to have to be administered a little bit different. And probably the best way to go is Class B for safety. Just because Class B, you're more than six feet, you might be 600 yards from any other operator <clears throat> that may want to go to uh, the same uh, spot. That's Matt Collette a uh, formerly um, a uh, police officer for our local force. And uh, the thing I would caution here on operating out of the back of your vehicle for field day, and by the way, uh, operating like that rather than in the vehicle, he's probably more a class B station uh, than he would be a uh, mobile station. So something to think about. Mobile says you gotta be completely in the vehicle and you could be able to roll down the road as you're transmitting, well, we've got a lot of things hooked into the vehicle. So it's more of a class B rather than a uh, mobile unit. But anytime you're operating uh, a mobile unit, uh, you've got to make sure that you're not right next to the antenna. <clears throat> He's on HF. That's a high frequency, high Q antenna. And um, the reason is, is he's probably far enough away uh, to meet the uh, uh, specifications of not getting himself nuked. But the RF from that antenna is going to get into his headset, uh, possibly uh, into uh, the microphone. So it's something to think about, and that is you want to try and separate yourself and not have an antenna within arm's reach on HF. Class B, there you go. Uh, no, this is not Maritime Mobile, <laughs> but that's uh, one of our uh, radio operators that uh, always enjoys a good uh, kayaking or a fast boat ride. But here he is, uh, ready set up for what will uh, be uh, a, a one Bravo operation. And uh, a good question is, what's the best antenna? A multi-mode or an off-center fed dipole seems to be the pick hit. Um, for our setups in the past, uh, we put the big six meter antenna up. And of course, when you put up that big antenna for a field day weekend, the six meter band does not open. So uh, last year, I just brought the three element six meter beam. And of course, the band was open. So that's the old uh, uh, class B. Uh, figure it out uh, on uh, <laughs> what hardware you're going to bring for your uh, single station operation. <clears throat> Uh, one time we even brought a three element beam, but again, this would not be classified as mobile. Uh, you would not be able to get the mobile designator uh, in that uh, it uh, is um, uh, firmly attached to the vehicle, but not one that you'd want to drive down the road with. Now, here is Maritime Mobile, <clears throat> as opposed to uh, Class B, uh, Maritime Mobile, uh, possibly Class C, uh, the Maritime Mobile for, in this case, uh, the 10 gig uh, contest uh, in the past. And if we were uh, spending field day, uh, the full weekend out there, then we would uh, operate as uh, Maritime Mobile. And we encourage all of you to try out new antennas that maybe you home brewed. Uh, we'll call this a uh, uh, class uh, home brew special. And this is a loop. And let me tell you, uh, this loop was quite a performer. Uh, the tuning was touchy, but nonetheless, small loops really have a good signal. <clears throat> We encourage all of you to set up by the water if you have a lake or a river or the ocean nearby because the water uh, in the direction of the HF uh, uh, skip coming in from abroad will many times uh, give you a second bounce and enhance your transmitted signal. And um, there's Jeff and Amanda <clears throat> about five years ago when we were up there for the big convention in Colorado. Amanda, look at that smile. Look at Jeff's smile. Uh, you kids were having fun. And um, we um, <clears throat> had a great time there. And Amanda said, you may want to set up uh, uh, maybe do a little operating down by uh, the little lake and the river. So I looked out of my window and I go, what is that? Is that a horse? No, that's a moose. And you don't want to mess with a moose. 
So Amanda and Jeff, no, I'd rather keep my distance and not do operating right there on that little bridge. Chip, K7JA and Janet, KL7ML. They, like I and Suze, love the beach. And here's Chip pounding in military mast. Notice he does it with a piece of wood, so he's not going to booger up the end of the mast. And uh, he's getting ready for a solo field day operation uh, back then. And uh, when I go to the beach, I keep my equipment, especially my ICOM 706. Gosh, that's a workhorse radio. How many of you in the chat room have a 706 that you will not part with? Till you see uh, maybe the new QRP rig coming. Uh, anyway, uh, the field day operation uh, there, uh, the uh, batteries in the back of the box there, and uh, we had a good signal on the air. Chip says, I'm ready, and he's going to be operating a battery portable, and uh, that is Class B battery uh, if he were to operate field day like that this year, in that he's getting his power from not only the battery, but from sunlight charging it. And, of course, satellite operation is allowed. And um, they say no crossband, but they give the exclusion that satellite crossband is perfectly okay. And as you can see, he's worked uh, AO51 um, uh, and a whole bunch of other stations via his satellite antenna. This is like a deluxe deal. He's not like holding that aero antenna forever. He's got the whole thing mechanized, and uh, it was a great performer. <clears throat> Uh, here's another uh, Class B battery operation. Uh, this is the HF Chinese radios that have been coming in. And um, that's a great way to try field day. So if you got one of those, uh, you could operate uh, portable. Just remember, when you're operating portable battery, you've got to stay below that 5-watt uh, level. <clears throat> And um, we encourage all of you to uh, have a good supply of whatever you're going to use for your battery. And you get extra credit if you stay off the AC power lines that may be nearby, station operating by his house. And he's on the air big style with his QRP rig. And uh, Kevin uh, with uh, the uh, BioNO batteries. Kevin has been talking with a lot of different clubs. He's been on Zoom meetings. And he really gives a lot of demos. And if you look just of his right hand that's the battery packs they're individual cells we'll be talking about them in a few more weeks but you don't just wire the cells all together they've got to go to a battery management device that's built into the bio -NO and then covered with that blue wrapping and um, kevin's quite happy because <clears throat> when you're running one of those batteries the bio -NO will hold its voltage to about 85 percent battery drain, whereas a common uh, battery, such as um, a, um, uh, let's see, a uh, wet cell battery, sealed lead acid, <clears throat> uh, does not have the capabilities that you see here on the board as the bio -NO. So even though you may have a, um, a good uh, little sealed lead acid that you see up in the upper end there, uh, if it's rated for 12 amp hours, it's going to give you about 6 amp hours, and then the voltage is really going to begin to decay uh, anytime you're transmitting. And we encourage all of you to consider uh, getting uh, uh, two points rather than one for sideband or FM, two points for operating CW as well as digital. But uh, do it on a bio -NO power. At uh, Quartz Fest, you'll see that uh, we've got uh, uh, the uh, big ICOM 9100 there and other radios all running on that uh, 20 amp hour battery. And uh, it went on and on and on. And that's the bio -NO battery. We're a big fan of that <clears throat> and the way Kevin takes good care of every customer. I'm not a big fan of Andersons because Andersons that regularly get used and you pull out them out of the box ready for field day, you plug, oh my gosh, I just plugged it in and they fell apart. Huh. Well, one looks like it burned up falling apart. The other one, just the plastic got weak. And there are different calibers of the Anderson connectors. So get them from a reliable source that buys their stock through a reliable source rather than coming in from overseas that may cut corners and the unit falls apart. 
And the rules uh, state, you know, uh, about uh, how much time you get to set up or you set up right on the hour, get 27 hours of operating rather than 24 uh, for field day. But it doesn't mean you necessarily have to put everything together before the field day begins. So I encourage you, uh, get into your own backyard and put together the basics of your antenna before you haul it over to where you're going to be operating field day. And don't do it on ice plants. I lost a little widget down there, and I'm still looking for it four years later. It's there. I even tried the metal detector, and it says, yeah, it's there. You just got to find it. I give up. <clears throat> got another one. Now, operating uh, from your home, that is class D. Uh, from your home means that the structure is attached to the home and generally a big three element beam and you may be running off of your home's AC power. So that would be uh, class D and home operation this year is encouraged because you can work another class D station. Whereas before uh, the pandemic uh, rules that the ARRL has uh, put forth, uh, it was not permitted for a class D home station to work another class D home station. So if you're going to be operating from your home, that's fine. If you can operate on portable battery or any kind of battery rather than the AC, uh, you'll get an advantage point uh, there. Operating from your EOC. Many of the uh, departments have closed out their EOC because they're staffed right now by public safety and city personnel. So we understand that you can't necessarily operate as these kids are from their EOC, but that would be class F. You may find some EOCs in the country that have made special provision to allow their hams to sneak into maybe an external radio room or their radio room may be attached to the EOC. But uh, EOC class F is going to be a little tough. Now, when we uh, uh, go from uh, the uh, EOC back to uh, your home station, maybe your backyard station, so you're on uh, battery, uh, that would be um, <clears throat> uh, Class E, emergency power. And uh, that's a little bit like a home uh, setup as well. And uh, all of this is fed off of the BioNO battery that we have down below. And, of course, digital. FT8 is what Chip and others made contact with Europe on a few days ago on six meters. Wow. And uh, FT8 is going to be in full swing. And uh, for those of you that uh, uh, will be doing FT8 to gain a whole bunch of uh, contacts and uh, new uh, countries and new everythings, uh, best success. Uh, some folks love FT8. And I admire all that it can do, especially for understanding propagation. <laughs> but it's much like going to a Zoom meeting where everybody else, all of the folks out there are on mute. <laughs> I want to hear someone laugh or make a goof up uh, giving their grid square, whatever. So uh, FT8, I commend those operators doing digital. And another form of digital for field day is uh, the solo operator, uh, one or two operators operating as a class B station where amateur television is uh, the norm. And there's analog ATV and there's now digital ATV. And to learn more about the switch from analog to digital, go to the Amateur Television Network. Just Google that. And uh, you'll see all about it. That's Don Hill. Uh, he's very big on ATV as well as uh, mesh networking and uh, all of the great uh, things that come to ham radio when it comes to digital. And uh, let's not forget our very lowest band, uh, or one of our lowest. This is next to the very bottom. This is the 630-meter band. I don't believe that it's allowed for field day, but if you want to snoop around and hear what's going on, you, you will need sort of a large coil. <laughs> we all laughed at this ham who brought this in, but one evening he made a contact uh, many hundred miles away, so we were convinced that the 630 meter band is, is one to explore right below the AM broadcast band. So it's fun what hams do. 
For those of you operating a handheld, uh, you're going to be class B and you would be battery because your handheld probably uh, won't be at five watts of power. But double check that you've got your rechargeable batteries in, but this is not going to work. This is an alkaline battery tray with rechargeable batteries in place. Well, I just pop it in the uh, drop-in charger and... And they don't seem to charge. Well, that's because there's no contact points on the battery tray. On purpose, you're supposed to put alkaline batteries in there. So if you've got a battery tray, which I absolutely recommend for handhelds, get a fresh set of batteries. Uh, double A's usually are the norm, as well as backup batteries and run your handheld and have fun on field day. On field day, uh, 146.52, of course, is the national calling frequency, but we encourage everybody to go up to 146.55 or 146.58. Here in Southern California, I'm assured that Chip and his uh, team, and they'll be all spread out, uh, more than 50 or 60 feet apart, uh, they're going to be doing a lot of uh, uh, activities on FM on both the two-meter band. Here's where you'll hear activity there. And on the 70 centimeter band, remember simplex only, uh, no cross band and no working through repeaters. So um, try uh, your luck with a handheld and uh, give out some points. And just uh, if you're on a handheld, just tell them you are one, meaning you, Bravo, meaning uh, you're uh, on a hand or uh, you're your own station and uh, battery, <clears throat> uh, which would indicate that uh, you're on a uh, small little handheld radio. <clears throat> you do not need an amplifier. Nope. Especially on two meters for 40. If you can hear them, you should be able to work them with the same amount of signal strength. And if you have a little uh, battery set up in a roller bag uh, and you're running just on solar power, that's fun. And we encourage all of you to give that a try for field day because field day is a once a year ham radio preparation for emergencies as well as ham radio showing itself off to the public. And hopefully there'll be a lot of videos of your single person or two person uh, uh, operation class B. Or if you've got a lot of folks, class A, uh, the five alpha and six alpha stations for five or six uh, transmitters on the air simultaneously. Um, but uh, try and get somehow the public involved and remember, wear a mask. Keep your distance and be prepared that at the end of field day, uh, anybody around will say, well, you know, I, I've got to watch my social distancing. So Janet, KL7MF, is uh, there uh, trying to get uh, 1,000 uh, pounds, no, make uh, 100 pounds of stuff uh, in the back of her vehicle. And that's what field day is all about. So all of you have fun at field day. Uh, stay socially distanced. Be sure that you've got your mask on and um, keep a good accurate log of your contacts. Uh, you don't need to know your grid square, but occasionally you'll get operators that'll ask, what's your grid square? Don't go back to them and saying, well, you don't have to do grid squares because, it, you know, no, they're trying to collect grid squares. and Maybe you're in one of those rare grid squares and field day is a great opportunity because the world is going to be on the air. So I'll be listening for you and I'll be on all of the different bands, uh, both day as well as night, um, operating, uh, I don't know, either Maritime Mobile or Mobile Mobile or maybe even at the home. So we'll see, but we'll be listening for you. So Don, that's my story for field day. Amanda is going to have bonus points, easily scored 100 bonus points for various different aspects of how you're working field day. But above all, with the pandemic upon us big time now and spreading quickly, wear your mask if there's anybody near you, especially upwind and you're downwind, put that mask on. And I'll look forward to hearing you on the air on field day. So Don, over to you again. Yeah, it should be, a, should be a, an interesting, different kind of field day. I'm going to actually, I think, get out of the house this year for field day, oddly enough. I've, I did the Delta thing the last couple of years, 
uh, here from the house, but I'm going to head to New Orleans and go over the river to the uh, West Side Amateur Radio Club, where I, actually I was president over there for a couple of times, and then they came to their senses and didn't reelect me. Um, I'm going to uh, go over there and visit their field day and see about getting on the air. And I'm going to bring my own headset. Hopefully they'll have a, a Heil. Uh, uh, well, if they're using an ICOM, I can just plug my Heil right into it because I'll have my my, my uh, adapter cable with me. But if not, if they have a Heil adapter cable into a brand K or a brand Y radio, well, that'll work as well. But that's the thing. Bring your own microphone because you don't want to be sharing microphones. That's that's kind of a no-no, especially if you're going to be going over to field. Thank you, Gordon. We appreciate that. Let's pause right now and have a word from our friends at ICOM, shall we? Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. The IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as you have base station features and functionality at the tips of your fingers and a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilo, or just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz. 5 watt battery operation with BP272 or 10 watts with a 13.8 volt DC supply. Modes include single sideband, CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functions a large 4.3-inch color touchscreen, and live band scope with waterfall, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, micro SD card for data storage, it comes standard with the HM243 speaker microphone, and it supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the LC192 optional backpack with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day in the park. Visit icomamerica.com amateur for more information about this and all the great ICOM radios. I saw Ray Novak uh, post on Facebook that he has one of those. So I would imagine he'll be making a visit to uh, the Jackson, Mississippi area and uh, probably get into a wrestling match with George and Tommy on, on who gets to take that thing home. Generally, Ray wins. Uh, that's just how that is. So be watching for that. But in the meantime, visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on the 705 and all the ICOM radios. You can also... Enter to win ICOM's weekly drawing for ICOM swag, like ICOM t-shirts, ICOM hats. Don't forget to check out the details on ICOM's monthly grand prize drawing, too, for a nice radio. Go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation. The official rules are there. And check out all of ICOM's previous drawing winners. You can see your name in that list coming up soon, we hope. Sign up and good luck. Uh, got a guest tonight, and that is Joe Eisenberg, K0NEB. If you've been to Hamvention at all, and been to one of his kit building forums. You'll recognize him. Of course, he's not wearing his hat, but he is the cat in the hat dude over at uh, at Hamvention. Quite famous for that. Probably one of the two or three most photographed people uh, over the years at uh, Hamvention because of the hat, uh, not necessarily because of his kit building stuff, which is just as awesome as the hat. But uh, how are you doing, Joe? Good to see you again tonight. I'm doing great, Don. And uh, I'll just give a brief word about what I'll be doing on field day. Uh, we're not doing the big club field day as we have in the past, but we will have four of us uh, operating, but without the uh, club radios. But we will do it at a different site this year on the Lincoln uh, Airport grounds. And I will be on 20-meter single sideband with my 7300 and Pro 7. And uh, uh, should be fun. Now, here's something, because I work in IT, uh, we had a customer that had these things, and I'll bet you remember that. Uh-huh. I was playing with mine just the other day, as a matter of fact. Yep. Well, uh, I've got them all ready to go so that all of our field day uh, stations will be using the Tough Books again this year. Uh, absolutely wonderful laptop. All I did was I nuke them and uh, reload them. And uh, now we can repurpose them for field day. And they're great emergency communications machines as well. So Yeah, and you can't uh, kill them. You just absolutely no. cannot kill them. No. No. And so they're designed, you know, if you could 
design a laptop for field day, it would be these old tough books. Yeah. And so I'm glad you've got one ready, uh, ready uh, to go for your trip to New Orleans. Um, I will be operating from the Lincoln Amateur Radio Club K0KKV, and we call ourselves King Kong's Vampires sometimes. So <laughs> like I said, you'll hear me on 20-meter sideband. Uh, uh, because of the pandemic, we're only having one person per shack. And so I will be on my own, but out at the field day site. Uh, the rest of our club members will be operating from home. And of course, we'll add up all the scores. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm hey, wearing before, my... we, before we get before we get deep in the field, I want to bring something up that's that's kind of cool. You were the recipient of a, a pretty prestigious award uh, the uh, from uh, the Yasme Group. Let's put that Victor put that award up. That is that's gorgeous. Tell us about this. This well, is cool. Thank, thank you, Don. That was that was really a shock. Uh, this is nothing that anybody applies for or even can get nominated for. Uh, the ASME Foundation uh, was founded many years ago. And if you remember, Lloyd and Iris used to travel around the world on their boat, activating all these rare islands and countries. And the ASME Foundation was an outgrowth of that. And uh, their estate uh, funded it. And so the ASME Foundation commonly finances a lot of the major de-expeditions. And uh, uh, several years ago, they started their own excellence awards. Uh, a lot of their recipients are de-expeditioners and de-exers and contesters. Uh, but they also recognize those of us in other ends of the hobby. And it was a an absolute shock when I saw this email saying that I'm getting one of these awards. And uh, I want to once again thank the Yasme Foundation for this recognition. I, it was just kind of one of those out of left field things. I think it's wonderful. And as you can see uh, uh, from the picture and from the wide out shot of me tonight, it has a prominent place in my shack on the top shelf right above my HF station. Well, congratulations. Yeah, I see it there over your shoulder. It's just, uh, it's gorgeous, and uh, you're well deserved of that with all the things that you've done for the hobby over the years, um, promoting kit building and, and just everything else. Uh, just, yeah, the perfect recipient. So, congratulations, my friend. I'm proud well, of you. Well, thank you. And by the way, I'm wearing my Hamcation shirt today because we just got email that Hamcation, as long as all goes well, will be the ARL National Convention next year. So something I to look that. forward to. Um, my other project recently has been with the 3D printer. And the reason I bought a 3D printer in the first place uh, last November was to make cases for kits. And I'll, I'll show you... Um, one of them, I don't know if you can see that, uh, that mm -hmm. case is 3D printed. And we can open it up and you can see there's the radio inside. And that's a kit that I'm going to be talking about here in just a little bit. So um, that was the reason I got the 3D printer. Uh, there's some fun things you can do with it. Uh, call signs. And maybe I'll make you one, Don. Cool. Makes nice 3D call signs. And I'm already working on another kit case. But we had kind of an interim here of a little over three months where this printer was running almost 24-7 for three months straight. And the reason was is I was producing face shields for our first responders here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, last Friday, I got an email from the head of logistics, the assistant chief of Lincoln Fire and Rescue, saying that they finally have a... Uh, a state sponsored supply, uh, but I was able to produce 227 face shields wow. for Lincoln Fire and Rescue. And these aren't the real easy ones, these are a little more complex. And this is what the uh, uh, plastic piece is that I made. And because this is kind of a the, the 3D printer I have is kind of a uh, beginner's type printer. Uh, I was only able to, pro uh, to produce six of these per day. So I ran it round the clock. And I'm kind of glad the project is over because that means they have an adequate supply. But I had only thought that they'd probably need a couple dozen. And then um, 
they'd have their supply back in March, and we all know how that happens. And so 227 face shields later and a lot of repair parts, because 3D printers are a constant maintenance item, uh, the 3D printer is now sitting here silent and waiting to build more kit cases. But I still have the plans and I still have the materials so I can ramp up immediately and go back to making the uh, face shields, Don. Very, very good. Well, uh, that's that's awesome. I remember when you first started that, and, and and like I said, you thought it would just be a few of those, and now, wow, over two hundred. Well, that's uh, that's amazing. That's that's yep. amazing. It, what it is what is? Yo, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, you, you've helped save lives, which um, totally and completely out of the ham radio realm, but yet, uh, you know, here we are doing what ever we all can do to to help the greater good and, and that is to keep all of us healthy and alive so that's uh that's amazing let's switch gears and get into the kits now since you mentioned it with the uh with the kit cases what is the latest in the world of kits you being the well, cq uh, magazine kit editor well i'm going to show one that i'm just starting on uh uh here in just a little bit so we're going to share our screen and we're going to make it so that we can uh uh, show you some pictures, and you can see my Cornhusker background here. How about that? And there we go. All right. Uh, this is a band module. The kit that I just held up uh, is from qrpguys.com, and it's a digital transceiver. And it has the band-specific parts on a plug-in that plugs into the top part of that box. So uh, hopefully that's coming through clear, and mm -hmm. uh, um, that is the plug-in module for the thing that I just uh, held up a, a little bit ago. You can see the crystal and the um, uh, toroids. Yes, you do have to wind those toroids, and uh, sometime I'm going to do a seminar on here, just nothing but winding toroids the right way, uh, so people won't be so afraid of them. Uh, this is a, a better picture of the one I just held up. Uh, it is double sideband, which means that some receivers might have a problem with that, but uh, most people don't have a problem at all. Uh, I had to cut holes in it for the receive and transmit LEDs so you can see those quite easily. And I used a Brother uh, P-Touch label maker uh, to make the labels for this. Uh, that's what the main board looks like. There's your antenna, your power, uh, your mic and headset. Uh, you got your gain controls and bias and so forth. There's your finals right there. Uh, puts out about three or four watts or so. And you have a relay here, and it's Vox operated. So as soon as your computer starts sending audio to it, it keys it right up. So you don't have to have the uh, uh, cat-type control. Now, here's another kit. This is put out by the Four State QRP group at 4sqrp.com. And this is the Crick Key. Now, I don't know if I ever got to show this on here, but they have a, a series of one watt CW transceivers that run on a nine volt battery, and they call it the Cricket series. And those kits uh, are CW transceivers with a really good receiver. And they're very simple and easy to put together. So they decided to come up with a companion kit. And what this is, is it's a keyer. And it has the paddles and everything. And the paddle material is made from thinner PC board than the main board. Now, this is actually a great kit for a beginning kit builder. And you end up with an iambic keyer. Now, it only has a speed control. You're not going to have any memories or or automatic responses or things like that. Uh, there's a soft wood, uh, a pine, kind of a plaque piece that makes the base of it. And you can see the two paddle pieces. And then these things look like volume controls, but really they adjust the spacing of each of the paddles to the center contact. And then this is kind of the backstop for it. And there's a very small number of components, very easy to put together. So let's look at the components in this kit. And you're going to see uh, you've got the battery tabs because it runs like the Cricut on a 9-volt transistor battery. you got three diodes. you got an LED. You've got a, 
uh, an IC uh, uh, thing here, and you got two other chips. You got your pot, and you've got your jack, and you have the resistors and capacitors and so forth. Very, very simple set of parts. Uh, even a beginning kit builder probably won't spend more than a little over an hour putting this together. Uh, this is what the main board looks like before you put the paddle parts on it. You can see the speed control pot right here. And we think it goes somewhere from about 5 to 30 words a minute. Um, the LED just blinks uh, when you're keying it so you know that it's working. And this is what the paddle parts look like. Now, you can see I already tinned them, and that's part of the construction process. You're going to tin those pads first before we put them all together. So when you slide them together, all you do is you heat up the two pads that were already tinned, and those blobs kind of mold together. And guess what? It makes your keyer paddles. And this is what the completed kit looks like. Uh, this is the Crick key, and like I said, these adjust the spacings of the left and right, and this adjusts the tension. Uh, we have a little rigidity here, and there is the backstop, your 9-volt battery, and your jack, which goes to your rig, and you're all ready to go. In fact, you'll probably hear a few of these running uh, those QRP crickets on field day if you're on CW. Now let's take a look at another kit. This is the main board from a uh, SO2R Mini. And what this is, is for your more advanced contesters, um, they use single operator two radio is their mode of operation. And it makes it easier for them to uh, run a frequency so they can occupy right. one frequency and then they... Uh, uh, transmit using one radio or the other because they can look for spots. And if they see that a section is is uh, on that they need, like in sweepstakes, a lot of people need Nebraska. So they say, oh, well, K0NEB is on 14308. So what they do is they take that second radio and they just dial that to 14308 and then they use this box to switch the mic and the headset and the push-to-talk controller, the CW keying and so forth from one radio to the next. And so uh, a unit like this makes that process a lot less expensive. Now, uh, the uh, designers of this were W1UE, K1XM, and NN1C, Marty. Uh, who's a past Young Ham of the Year, and mm -hmm. uh, he designed this circuit. Uh, the smarts of it is this Arduino Nano module, which you have to solder the pins. So, so this is when I'd soldered one pin on one side and one pin on the other and made sure it's straight. Then I'm ready to go and solder all the pins because now it's all straight and we don't have to worry about it. Uh, that is the smarts that run this thing. And this is what it looks like. Now, don't be afraid of surface mount parts because these three audio transformers, which are uh, audio isolation coupling transformers, which, of course, get rid of any uh, ground loops and hum and so forth, these things do solder to pads. But as you can see, they're pretty big. And so uh, it's not hard at all. All I do is I soldered one pin while I've actually got my fingers holding the back side of that part. So I can straighten it up, make all the pins line up to all six pads. And then I, uh, once it's secure on the one pad, then I just solder all the other pads. And it looks nice and neat and straight. Uh, the neat thing about his design is all five of these uh, double um, mini jacks are identical. All four of these capacitors here and these three are actually all seven together are the same value. All four resistors are the same value. All three diodes are the same value. All four transistors are the same value. So guess what, Don? That means Didn't that we're proof. not going to... Yeah, you're not going to mess up. Proof. You're not going to pull the the wrong resistor. Now these it's extra options. <laughs> that's right. These extra <laughs> options that you see here in the middle are for enhancements that you can add to that, depending on the configuration of your contest station. That's cool. And this is what the end of the box looks like. Uh, the lettering is cut into the plastic panels, but there's no paint, and so. The neat thing is, is that the masking from it 
is still there. So all you got to do is take a little paintbrush and you paint over the masking tape and it fills in the holes. And then after that dries, you peel off the masking tape that's already on it and it's already painted. So you have the lettering and everything already marked. Nice. Really nifty little kit, very low cost. I think it's around $60, which is pretty much unheard of when you're talking about uh, a very complex interconnection box for SO2R operation. Uh, let's look cool. at this kit here. This is called the MicroBitX version 6. Now, I built the first one, and a friend of mine made a... Uh, uh, 3D case for it, and that's how I got introduced to 3D printing. This is a kit that you see something is missing, Don. What is missing? Me. There's there's no soldering iron. I'm not soldering oh. anything. You don't have to solder this kit to put it together. All you need is a screwdriver. Really? This is this is a lot of fun. What this is, it's an 80 through 10 meter QRP single sideband and CW transceiver that has a touch screen. It's absolutely amazing. And wow. uh, um, it comes from India. And all you got to do is um, uh, look up the MicroBitX or UBitX online and you'll find this kit. And uh, I think they're able to ship from India again. Not sure, but hope so. I actually got this shipped, I think it was a day before India shut off their uh, shipping to the world. They shut everything down. And so I was fortunate to get it. This board comes pre-assembled. That's the main board. This is the smarts of it, the uh, front panel and the processor. And then you have all these cables that are already set up. Uh, all the pigtails are made and everything that just plug on to the different connectors on the main board. It comes with two sets of those. And the reason they do that is some people don't buy the case. Uh, I'd advise getting the case because everything fits nicely. But some people like to build that into something else. And so you get a whole nother set of wires so that you can build this stuff into your own case if you want. Nice. Okay, so we'll look at the lid here. Uh, you just bolt the speaker in place in the right position. There's the cable for the speaker. There's what it looks like all completed on the inside. And it, it really doesn't take long. Uh, I would say that the average builder who's built stuff before will probably spend about 45 minutes with this thing. Uh, if you're a first-time builder, probably a little longer. But once again, no soldering. You just plug this thing in, and it's really slick. Um, the only calibration you do, I think, is the 5 megahertz thing where you're, you zero beat it with WWV, and then that sets the baseline for the uh, um, synthesizer. And this is what the front panel looks like. Um, it's pretty small. I have small fingers, and I have trouble doing the touchscreen. But the good thing is it comes with a plastic stylus in the kit. Not only comes with the mic and speaker, but it comes with a stylus so you can touch those little squares and set it up. It has split operation. There's a lot of guys that use this uh, on FT8 and other low-power digital modes. Uh, once again, the case was not pre-marked, so I use the Brother P-Touch label maker to put this together. Very nice. Now, this is the latest and greatest. Everybody want to know what it is? Remember, we just showed you that DSB FT8 transceiver. This is another one. This one puts out about four watts. If you look at this, there are nine cards, and look at how the components are already identified for you, marked by value, and all ready to go. So all you got to do is pluck that part off of these cards, and it comes pre-packed like that. So once again, it's Don-proof. It's got the parts exactly where <laughs> they belong, so you don't have to worry about the tiny little letters and numbers that are on the uh, capacitors or the resistors. Now, I say that, but in reality, it's a good idea, if you have any doubts, to test them. And yes. there's a lot of low-cost testers that you can get now that test any component. Um, so if you have any doubts, definitely use a component tester. And uh, that's another subject for another show. Um, and this is the main board. 
Now you'll notice there are surface mount parts on this. You can see there's one there, one there, one there, one there, and one there. And the newer version of the board, this part here on the uh, lower right uh, is replaced with surface mount as well. And four state QRP makes a lot of kits this way too now. And what it is is the board comes with the surface mount parts already done for you. So all you got to right. do is solder the parts on. Now you can see that compared to the uh, uh, other CW, uh, the other FT8 transceiver, uh, this one's a little more complex to put together, but uh, it's an enjoyable build. But uh, I thought I'd give you a sneak preview of an upcoming column of mine. Uh, that kit is now currently in process. As you Good. can see. What's, what is that? Uh, what's that kit called? Someone in the chat room asked about that. Uh, this is uh, put out by Midnight Design Solutions. Okay. And it's called the Phaser. So if you look phaser. up Midnight Design Phaser, uh, it'll take you right to it on, uh, on uh, Google. And like I said, now Four State makes a 75 meter AM transceiver, and it has over 110 or 120 surface mount parts and only 30 components that you have to put on the board. However, four of those are toroids. Um, yeah. So um, you can't have a kit without something you got to solder or wind, right. you know? Right, right, but, right. But. This is kind of the latest trend, and I call these hybrid kits because, once again, the surface mount parts are already done for you. And they do they do pin cushion check these boards so right. that we know that the surface mount parts are where they belong. Well, that is, uh, that is incredible. And, of course, uh, if anybody wants to keep up with you, the best way, of course, is through CQ Magazine, where you do the CQ monthly Magazine. kit, do the monthly kit uh, column. We'll take a quick look at the bench here. Uh, this is the cleanest this bench has been in 35 years. <laughs> we had a signal generator and a freak counter. Both used to reside under the bench because I couldn't even get space on the shelf. Uh, I have my power supply and I have one of those cigarette lighter things with USBs on it because a lot of kits uh, require that for power and raspberry right. pies, things like that. I use an FT817 and an auto tuner as my window to the outside world because the worst thing in the world, Don, is to put together a kit and then you hook it up to the outside world and then you hear nothing. nothing well, guess what? Yeah. The band is dead, you know? So, right. so you have right. a known radio and you can also listen to your signal and stuff and see what it sounds like on a known radio. Um, I have a two-story uh, solder roll holder. Uh, my problem is there are two creatures in this house that have a tendency to turn rolls of solder into toys. One is uh -huh. Newton and the other is Tesla. So when you have two cats, you got to have that. The main meter here that I use is an early 1980s Fluke 8000A. And I had that restored uh, very inexpensively by a guy from, uh, I think, Texas. Uh, you ever see the suspender man at HamFest? He sells yep. uh, restored fluke equipment because that was his career. And so he uh, did the power supply mod and everything for mine and certified it. So it is fluke certified. Awesome. Now, you do... Um, uh You've been known to do uh, seminars via Skype, correct? Like, like, like all of us do now, right? Yes, I have. In fact, I I have actually done almost as many uh, Skype and Zoom uh, seminars as I do when I travel to Hamfest. All right. So, well, because we're we're in the we're in the summer of no Hamfest now. So if if some club wants to have you uh, come in and and be a guest via Skype or Zoom, uh, how is the best way that they can uh, they can get in touch with you? It is very easy, Joe, J-O-E, at K0NEB.com, or you can use the address on QRZ. Uh, this is an Edson Loner um, uh, soldering station. A lot of people ask me why I don't have a fancy well or anything. This is the most reliable soldering station I think I've ever had, and it really right. holds the temperature good. You can see the uh, microbitics up there. That's also up there as another reference receiver. I have a big dummy load, and then I have my Tektronix 465 and another signal generator over there. This radio over here is my AM and FM and shortwave broadcast for while I'm working on kits. 
And uh, on the left side, uh, I have a dual key here because some kits need a paddle, some need a straight key. And I have an extra straight key and a couple of fluke meters that I've been able to restore cordless soldering iron and 10 analyzer and all the goodies that makes up a bench done so Very cool. that is kind of the way things look right now and we're going to see Very if cool. this is going to let me come back and yeah now you get to see my crazy ugly face again <laughs> very cool we're going to move on and we're going to talk a little bit about icom joe is going to hang out with us till the end of the show so if chat room if you have questions get those in the chat room amanda will be taking a look at those and uh We'll be back with Joe in just a little bit. Let's get into the news of the week and the solar update as well from Newsline and Dr. T. From Amateur Radio Newsline report number 2,225. These are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, June 24th, 2020. We begin with an amateur radio TV event you won't want to miss. Two high-flying hams taking a walk together in space. NASA TV plans to have live coverage on Friday, the 26th of June, and again on Wednesday, July 1st, as NASA astronauts Robert Binken, KE5GGX, and Chris Cassidy, KF5KDR, venture outside the International Space Station to replace batteries on one of the ISS power channels. It's a power upgrade that swaps out the old nickel-hydrogen batteries with lithium-ion batteries that were delivered last month to the station on a Japanese cargo ship. The live broadcasts of the walks will be seen on NASA television and the agency's website, and it's expected that the walks could last as long as seven hours. Chris is the commander of Expedition 63 and will be identifiable by the red stripes on his spacesuit. Doug joined the crew in May following the historic launch of SpaceX's Crew Dragon Endeavor spacecraft. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Andy Morrison, K9AWM. There are even more happenings above the Earth, and this one concerns the sun. With all our eyes on the sun and the first twinklings of Solar Cycle 25, it appears we're getting some big help into solar insights from the Solar Orbiter that was launched earlier this year by the European Space Agency from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. On Monday, June 15th, the orbiter was reported to have made its first perihelion, the point in the orbit that is closest to the sun, in its mission to capture detailed imagery. In this case, that distance is 77 million kilometers, or half the distance between the sun and our Earth. Although the Parker Solar Probe launched in 2018 by NASA makes approaches closer to the sun, it does not have telescopes to capture such direct imagery. The Sun Exploring Spacecraft, a joint venture between European Space Agency and NASA, has 10 scientific instruments on board, including six telescopes, to help with its nine-year mission. A posting on the ESA website said that the images are to be released in mid-July and are described as the closest images of the sun to ever be taken. It will also attempt to capture the first images of its polar regions. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Kevin Trotman, N5PRE. Although there's always excitement in space, whenever astronauts talk to school kids back home on Earth, there's been some space-related excitement down here as well recently. There's a new independent organization in the United States that will be connecting students with the astronauts aboard the International Space Station via ham radio. Part of its name might sound familiar, the group is called ARIS USA. The nonprofit is independent from the more familiar ARIS International, with which it will continue its collaboration on some projects. ARIS USA's main mission, however, is to arrange for ISS astronauts' contact with students via amateur radio and to encourage education in science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. Its new status now makes it eligible to apply for grants and to receive proposals for future ISS contacts. ARIS USA's Frank Bauer, KA3HDO, said that the move to an independent organization from a working group will also allow the entity to apply for grants and to sign agreements. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Paul Brown, WD9GCO. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Andy Morrison, K9AWM, Kevin Trotman, N5PRE, Paul Brown, WD9GCO, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now, here's the solar update from Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. 
Space weather this week continues to amble along. As we switch to our front side sun, you can see we have two bright regions that have rotated into Earth view, but unfortunately, as time has gone on, these regions have fizzled quite a bit, so they're barely visible anymore. We are at a spotless sun, and I'm sorry to say the solar flux is not doing all that well. Now, we also had a solar storm launch on the 21st. It was kind of a complicated solar storm launch, and part of it is Earth-directed. NOAA has done a prediction model run for it, and it looks like this storm may graze Earth right around the 27th, but we're not expecting all that much. We were hoping this dark filament would actually lift off, but it has managed to hang on. That would have been a really good solar storm, but doesn't look like much there. Now, also, we have uh, a coronal hole that's uh, going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone here in the next couple days, and it could be sending us some fast wind in about three, maybe four days from now, but we're not really expecting all that much from it either. And unfortunately, all of this is not a good story when it comes to field day for you amateur radio operators and emergency responders. Now, as we switch to our far side sun, this is Stereo A, and it's looking at the sun pretty much from the side. You can see those few bright regions rotating off the stereo's west limb. Those are the bright regions that fizzled out in Earth view. And sadly, there's not a lot behind it. We see a little bit in the north and in the south, but the northern region, bright region on the east limb, kind of fizzled out. Now we have a bright region on the southern limb. Well, we'll see what happens when it rotates into view. But sorry to say, as far as field day is concerned for you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, it looks like the solar flux on Earth's day side is going to stay in the poor range. Switching to our moon, we are now coming out of the new moon on our way to a first quarter, and by the 28th, the moon will be about 50% illuminated. So night sky watchers, you're going to have to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that somewhat Earth-directed solar storm to graze us around the 27th, but it's just going to be a glancing blow, so we're not really expecting all that much. Plus, we do have a little bit of fast solar wind that's going to be a bit of a chaser after this solar storm. So at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting unsettled conditions with up to about a 15% chance of a minor storm, especially in through the weekend. Now, mid-latitudes, we're only expecting normal to unsettled conditions with up to about a 10% chance of active conditions maybe on the 27th and then also again maybe on the 29th or somewhere in there as that fast wind begins to catch up with all of this and it only if that solar storm gives us any kind of disturbance whatsoever. So overall, things are going to be pretty quiet this week. Uh, a high latitude aurora photographers, you might get a chance for something, but don't expect all that much other than fleeting shows for aurora. Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, we are having a spotless sun again, folks, where it was a couple bright regions on the Earth-facing disk, but they have pretty much fizzled. And so that means everything is in the green for big flares. We have no risk for radio blackouts, and this should make GPS users on Earth's day side very happy. Unfortunately, it also means the solar flux is back in the high 60s, and that means poor radio propagation on Earth's day side. Wonderful, just in time for field day. I know that's a problem, but you're just gonna have to deal with it. And sadly, it looks like this is gonna continue easily throughout this week and maybe even longer, because even on the sun's far side, we're really not seeing much of a chance of reprieve. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, uh, we're not quite out of solar minimum yet, are we? We're trying, but solar cycle 25 sure is starting awfully slow. Now, also, because we are still dealing with solar minimum conditions, well, the uh, cosmic ray flux is a bit higher than it normally would be. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew who fly over 800 hours annually and fly at high altitudes and high latitudes. You are in the moderate range for radiation dose, and this does include prenatal passengers. So please take this into consideration in your flight plans. For more details on this week's space weather, including details on that grazing solar storm and the fast solar wind, come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Thank you, Dr. T. And of course, follow her on Twitter at Tamitha Scove. You will be glad you did. You know, just like, uh, there it is, right there, spaceweatherwoman.com. Just like field day, it's all about being prepared for the unexpected. And that's where last pass comes in because it's important to have a plan for the unexpected. And last pass, that will help you do just that with your passwords. LastPass can be deployed very quickly in the midst of any event to ensure that your business keeps running smoothly and every employee login is secure. And with a lot of people working from home these days, this is vital. 
Single sign-on uh, manages employee access and a centralized view, so IT always has insight into who has access to what and from where. Enterprise password management ensures oversight of shadow IT and enforceable policies across all password-protected accounts. Multi-factor authentication requires additional factors to provide a user's identity with the use of uh, biometric and contextual factors. Make the process smooth for employees. Now, if you're a business, you should be thinking about additional layers of defense beyond the password. And LastPass will not store or send uh, the master password to anybody. If LastPass can't access your data, hackers can't either. Encryption happens exclusively at the device level before syncing to LastPass, so it's safe storage and only users can decrypt their data. They use 256-bit AES encryption. It's the same encryption type utilized by banks in the military. LastPass protects while providing a seamless workflow for your employees. Account access and passwords can be shared securely between employees, whether in the office or working remote. And employees will get secure access to their work applications with SSO and password management. And there's an offline mode for uh, both password management and multi-factor authentication, so your employees can also access what they need. LastPass is used at Twit a lot, so share. Uh, you need to go and, and, and check out LastPass. If it's good enough for Twit, it's certainly good enough for you. LastPass can help make remote work simple and secure. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help your business stay productive and secure no matter what. That is lastpass.com slash twit. Amanda has been watching the chat room, and uh, I'm sure we probably have a question or two for uh, for Mr. Eisenberg. Amanda, how are you tonight? I'm doing good. And yes, I do have a, a couple of questions for Joe. I was just going to breeze through all of your bonus points this year for yes. field day. Uh, first of all, I think it's kind of, it's weird because all of a sudden one deltas can operate at home, but they can submit their scores to your club and then the club can submit that. So uh, expect some very big variations of points this year. That's all I have to say about that. Um, all right, let's go over these bonus points uh, real quick here. First of all, number one, and this one is the most important if you ask me or anybody that works uh, in industry at all, your safety officer, please select a safety officer safety officer. This is the most important thing you can do. They need to make sure everything is grounded correctly, make sure gas cans are put away, make sure all guy lines are flagged so that you're not running into them, so that you're not tripping over um, extension cords, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Your feed line, have a safety officer, just somebody that will overlook all of that and sign off on the checklist from the ARRL and say, yep, we were operating as safe as possible. And of course, mind all of your uh, tower safety guidelines as well. Um, all right, so number one, uh, emergency power. You get 100 points if you're all on emergency power, meaning solar, battery, not generator, nothing petroleum operated, don't plug it in. Operate that way and uh, you're going to get a lot more points for your QSOs, first of all, plus you get the extra 100 po bonus points per station that you have. All right, media publicity, 100 points just for trying to submit to um, your local papers, your local news stations that you're operating in field day, and that will give you 100 points. It doesn't even have to be published. Just have proof that you submitted it to them, and you get a boom, 100 points, just like that. Public location. Now, this one's tricky this year because We've been encouraged by the ARRL to not really be that public and not to invite a lot of public people, but yet being in a park or something like that will get you that extra 100 points. Um, public information table. This is where you find all of your handouts at the ARRL. You print a few out and you have them on the table for if there is public that comes to visit you, you hand one of those out and say, and explaining exactly what ham radio is. A hundred points right there, just for having some pamphlets on your table to to hand out. Again, um, the national traffic system, everybody aware of that? Submit your um, NTS to your section manager. That's a hundred points, boom, instantly. Then you can send 10 more messages for 10 points a piece to give you another hundred points. How easy is that? All right, satellite QSOs. Now, I've heard this one is a little bit more difficult to do. Make one QSO via satellite, you get an extra 100 points. But 
evidently those birds are pretty busy during field day, so it can be a little bit more difficult than you expect. Plus, you want a seasoned operator to try to handle that. Also, I'm going to tie in with that the educational portion where you have lessons. Now, satellite QSO would be very, very educational as well as the next one coming up, which is five QSOs on alternate power. So again, you'd use solar power, you could use bicycle powering, um, giving you the power for your battery to make five QSOs. This is a fun one because you can do anything you want to have fun with this. I don't know, tie a string around a kid and ask him to run around the pole. No, I'm kidding about that one. Um, again, the, the educational activity bonus is one of the newest ones that the ERRL has, as well as the safety officer. And it's, it's excellent. Learn about uh, mesh networks. So uh, have a, a lesson on AREDN and see what happens. Uh, an extra 100 points just for having a learning lesson. Not a bad deal. Now let's talk about the go to station. The go to station is going to get you an extra 100 points. But then there's so much more involved in that. You have extra points if one person sits at the go to station and makes 20 contacts, you get another 20 bonus points. Wow. If you have a go to coach sitting there the whole time, basically instructing everybody how to make these contacts and telling them what the radio is all about, teaching them their phonetic alphabet, things like that, another 100 points. So those are really easy ways to take advantage of bonus points. The other um, one that has been around forever is uh, copying the W1AW bulletin. They have a schedule that they're going to release, I believe, tomorrow. And uh, you just get on the air and you can copy it either via CW, phone, or digital. So how hard is that? Just copy the message and you get 100 points. Awesome. Field day youth participation. Again, this might be a little bit limited because of the fact that we are all doing social distancing and maybe not everybody's going to bring their kids out to field day. But if you get those youth involved, you get an extra 20 points per youth that gets on the air. So it's a great way to get them active and talk about ham radio and get yourself some extra points. The number one hardest one is going to be um, elected officials and officials from our served agencies such as uh the, uh, the Red Cross and uh, Salvation Army and your emergen emergency management team. So what happens uh, if they visit, you get 100 points. But again, it's going to be really difficult this year. And also, by the way, I just want to put out that ARIES officials do not count for that. Uh, so no, your section manager, your section emergency coordinator, any of those people do not count for those points. Um, and th then last, we have... If you just submit your whole thing via web, you get 50 points. So if you submit your scores uh, on the on ARRL's website, boom, 50 extra points. So you guys do that. Have fun. We, we all need some extra points now that we know that our QSOs are going to be down and things like that. But there's going to be a ton more people on the air, which I'm really looking forward to. We're going to have a whole lot of one deltas out there operating in one echoes. And uh, this is the time to embrace it. And we're going to hear a whole lot more voices. All right. Let's, uh, and by the way, enjoy field day, everyone. I hope you have a great time. Uh, I, I know it's going to be way different and I think that this should be a bonus point, but your food spread should say a lot about your club and your activities. So um, it's just my two cents. Uh, you got to be doing the barbecuing and all of that in typical years. I know this year is different. Okay, so Joe, let's get to some questions for you, my friend. All right, uh, first, ready to go. I have to, I have to show off this. Because I have one, too. Oh, I love those See? things. It's wonderful. It is I'm glad stupid you, heavy. <laughs> but we use them for field day every year. Uh, I think the only thing loaded on it is a, a Windows operating system and N3 FJP. Uh, I think that's it. <laughs> that's pretty much what I put on these. Uh, and the older ones that I get that still work but but won't 
uh, upgrade or even run 7 very well, I put Ubuntu Linux on them. And uh, there are logging programs for field day you can get uh, that operate in Linux. Wow, that's amazing. So also you mentioned NIST or WWV. So I had to, I was wearing this shirt the whole night. Like, I don't know. I don't know how we meshed this well, but that was great. Um, my next question for you, Joe. Uh, so you've been doing a lot of kit building for a really long time. What have you done with all of those kits that you've built this whole time? <laughs> you know, I've I've gotten that question a few times. And what I do is I find little parts boxes like this uh, at work or so forth or from ham radio stuff. And I put one or two kits in those and I store them away in those plastic storage tubs. And, and I try to mark the boxes so I know where they are. And the reason I do that is because quite often they will have updates or modifications that improve it. And I will take that kit out and then I will put those upgrades in and I will write about that in CQ. So uh, that's what I do with most of them. But I do hang on to them because um, there are changes or sometimes like in the case of the cricket there was the crick key so i want to have the cricket to go with the crick key so there's a lot of things that build on other kits and that's why i hang on to them but i i try to wrap them up protect them and put them into a plastic tub for storage very good well thank you joe for that and um let's see what else oh don this one was just for you I don't believe that you mentioned the call sign that you would be operating under if you do go out to New Orleans this weekend. Yeah, it's uh, WD5ABD. It's on the west bank across the river from New Orleans, which actually, if you look at a map, is south. But it's called the West Bank because it's it's called the West Bank. And there is a, a the, the first clubhouse for the club back in the 50s was in the community of Algiers. And so WD5ABD was always Whiskey 5 Algiers Beer Drinkers. So be listening for the Algiers Beer Drinkers, and uh, hopefully I'll be on there. And I, I just I don't know if you heard my dog yell at me. I just, unbeknownst to me, he was in here, little Ted was in here, and I backed up my chair to grab this and ruled right over him. But uh, I just wanted to pull, <laughs> pull this out, part of the, the, the tough book, uh, the, the tough book fetishes uh Society of America here, apparently. So, hope my dog's okay. He wasn't real happy about me rolling my chair over him. He's 15 years old, so you know he needs a little excitement in his life, but probably not that kind. But yeah, WD5 ABD Whiskey Five Alpha Bravo Delta, the Algiers beer drinkers. Okay, well, thank you. And um, I ran over my dogs before with the chair, and that was nothing compared to the noise that they made. Uh, Joe, what about you? What uh, what call sign are you operating under this weekend? will be K0KKV, Kilowatt Zero King Kong's Vampires, the Lincoln Amateur Radio Club. Okay, and I'll be operating with uh, Rocky Mountain Ham, and we're going to be November Zero Sugar Zulu, um, is what they always like to say, or Sugar Zebra, either one. And I'm really looking forward to that. So speaking of field day, everyone, our viewers, whatever you're doing, whether it's going to be that you're going to throw um, – an off-center on your backyard or you're going to go to a group, send us your pictures this weekend. Post them on our Facebook page. We would love to hear from you. And maybe they'll be featured on the next show. Along with that, if you're going to do much more and you're going to do some drone footage and do some video recording, please be sure to send that to Dale. And that's at hamnationvideos at twit.tv. We'd really appreciate putting those videos together to let us all know that Field Day still existed this year, even under different circumstances. Uh, let's see. Other than that, um, oh, so, you know, Twit produces other shows here, right? Everybody, they do. Ham Nation is not the only one. It's a true statement. Uh, I'm going to be on a special episode this weekend uh, on Friday evening. This is This is going to be horrendous but fun at the same time. I was invited to be on the uh, virtual treasure hunt version and it's going to feature uh, Micah Sargent is going to be hosting this and a bunch of us twit hosts are going to be on there. Unfortunately, I'm going to be camping because I'm going to be at field day. So this is going to be a virtual 
treasure hunt from things that you will find in your own house. And I'm not even going to be in my house. I'm going to be in a camper. So this is going to be interesting. I'm probably going to lose, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, all right, let's uh, wrap it up here with some nets. We have uh, D-Star and 14 Charlie. We have DMR on 31.012. We have, uh, I do believe, uh, 40 meters is going on 71.92 and 20 check around 14 to 68. All right. That was a lot of talk. Don? Back to We've you. had a good show tonight. It's uh, it's yeah. always good to have Joe Eisenberg on to uh, fill us in on what's going on with uh, the kit building world and and uh, very cool about doing the, the face masks for the COVID first responders. And again, very cool about the YASME Excellence Award. Very well deserved. So uh, thanks for uh, being on here. And, and tell us again, Joe, uh, you know, we all do uh, Skype sessions with all the clubs, all the, all the Ham Nation hosts, and you do as well. Uh, everyone knows our email addresses. So uh, tell them yours again one more time. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you, they can. All right, Don. Thank you very much for the kind words. Um, my easiest address to remember is joe, J-O-E, at K-Zero-N-E-B.com. Joe at K-Zero-N-E-B.com. And there yes, you go. I, can well, do, I can do Skype. I can do Zoom. Uh, I can do any of the other teleconferences. And I'm on fiber, so I have no problem. Very good. And a very, very good thing for your club to do to uh, have Joe come in and, and do a seminar. It will uh, definitely uh, definitely enhance uh, the things that uh, enhance a club meeting, that's for sure. Joe, again, thanks for being on here. Be safe and uh, have fun at field day. And thanks for the help. And uh, appreciate your friendship over these uh, long years that we've known each other. We met through Bill Pasternak. And of course, uh, he's no longer with us, but we're carrying on. And you see his, uh, see his old uh, um, license plate behind me. So happy to have that on there. Thanks again, Joe. We appreciate you. And thanks to uh, everybody else tonight. Uh, thanks to uh, Gordon and thanks to Amanda and, of course, uh, everybody else who works on the show, uh, like Victor, behind the scenes. And, of course, you, the viewers, we couldn't do it without you for sure. So we'll uh, hope you all have a very, very good field day. Stay safe. Be nice to each other. And uh, we'll see you again here next week here on Twit. So from all of us at Ham Nation, we love you. We appreciate you. And uh, we'll see you next week. Good night, everybody. 73s. Check out other shows here on Twit TV, including my show, Hands-On Photography. On this show, I'm going to show you how to get the most out of your camera, as well as be a better post processor. So head on over to twit.tv hop and subscribe now. Oh.